do this. Let's talk about talk. Hey there, I'm Dr. Andrea Wojnicki. You can call me Andrea. Thanks for listening to Talk About Talk. This is where we learn and talk about all things communication. Because when we communicate effectively, we can be a better manager, coworker, parent, partner, and friend. A better human being, really, don't you think? Speaking of better humans, I can't wait to introduce you to today's guest, Tosca Reno. Tosca is kicking us off in this, the first of a three-episode Talk About Talk podcast series focused on self-talk. This is the first time we've done this, but self-talk is such an important topic that I thought it warranted three episodes. In this current episode, number 25, we focus on building resilience. We're defining resilience here simply as the capacity to recover from difficulty or adversity. In next week's episode, number 26, I'll summarize the research that I uncovered to help us all become better at our own self-talk. In other words, how we can optimize our inner voice. And then in the third episode in this self-talk series, episode number 27, Tosca Reno will be back with us and you'll hear her take on positive self-talk and the three E's of wellness. You can trust me when I tell you that this woman has some incredibly valuable advice for us. So let me introduce Tosca to you now and we'll get into the interview right away. I'll summarize some of Tosca's main points at the end. And as always, everything's available in the show notes on the talkabouttalk.com website. Now then, let me introduce Tosca. I met Tosca Reno a few months ago through a mutual friend and I knew right away that I had to get her on Talk About Talk. This woman, her story, and her resilience are nothing less than incredible. So we're starting this Talk About Talk self-talk three-episode series with this interview, which we call Building Resilience, Sets and Reps. You'll see in a minute why this title is absolutely perfect. Tosca Reno is a New York Times bestselling author, founder of the Eat Clean Diet Health Revolution, a health and wellness expert, a transformation coach, a motivational speaker, star of a Gemini award-winning reality TV show, a physique competitor, and a mother of four. Tosca started her career at an age when most would consider retiring, earning her first Oxygen magazine cover at age 43 after losing 84 pounds and healing herself. She's competed in numerous physique contests and endurance events. The founder of the Eat Clean series that kicked off a revolution by the same name, Tosca has sold millions of copies in several languages. She's helped millions lose weight and become well, thanks to eating clean. Tosca is an expert health and wellness advisor for CanFit Pro, where she speaks, lectures, and conducts wellness seminars and online education programs. She regularly contributes to various publications, including Oxygen and Clean Eating, and she's currently developing a TV series with PBS. Tosca is best seen live, where she rivets the audience with her gut-wrenching authenticity. You'll get a taste of this in a minute when you hear her voice. She loves life, and she's a tenacious woman who has injured intense personal loss, including the passing of a son, her husband, and ultimately the family business and home. Tosca Reno is the epitome of resilience. She is a force. Thank you very much, Tosca, for joining us and talking with us today about resilience. It's my pleasure to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. I thought we would start at the bottom. Always a good place when you have to go up. <laughs> yeah, so... What did your life look like and how did you end up there when you were at the bottom? So it was in my 30s and I weighed 204 pounds at my heaviest. So I was obese and clinically not well. So I was beginning to get the early signs of type 2 diabetes. I knew, like a lifestyle diabetes. And my father had died of heart disease young. He was only 64. And I was starting to get heart palpitations. So was really young to be experiencing all these things and I had a young family as well. So so life at the time was really just a series of uh, having babies and moves. My then husband was with um, Imperial Oil and so we were we were always moving for his to further his career. So there's really not a lot of opportunity for me to work even though I was I was schooled myself and wanted to have a career. Uh, but I was blessed to be able to stay home with my children. It's just that I was very underserved and felt the lack of worth, and then lonely and isolated, and ate my way into oblivion. It wasn't cute. So then you divorced him? Yes, I made a decision to go out on my own. So in 1999, I um, 
serve notice <laughs> and started my, I went back to school as a, an amateur student and got my degree in uh, education. I have a couple of other degrees, but got my degree in education thinking, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to become a teacher. I'll teach and I'll make a living for myself because I wasn't really at the time gainfully employed. So did that. And then you know, as luck would have it, uh, began my journey into wellness, um, albeit with a limited scope, because t- then I thought wellness was simply strapping on your running shoes and running. Mm-hmm. I hadn't thought about uh, changing the way I ate, other than counting calories, which is a foolish notion. And so I really needed an education in that, but first I had to fall a few times. So literally, I strapped on my running shoes in my fat clothes, got on the treadmill, and shot off the back end of it. That was the level of my ignorance. Wow. Um, yeah. And then, as luck would have it, as I say, uh, I think the student was ready, so the teacher arrived, and the teacher arrived in the form of Robert Kennedy, who I didn't know anything about him. I didn't know that he was an icon in the bodybuilding industry or any, I knew nothing. He was on the playground with his daughter. He would bring his daughter to school. We chatted and, and I would say foolish things like when he asked me if I was working out, I'm like, yeah, I'm running. I'm really loving it. You know, I sounded so stupid. Um, (laughs) And uh, I said, I just want, I just want to be fit. And he said, if I had a dime for every person who ever said that I'd be a millionaire. Well, I'm not. So he kind of issued me a challenge and he said, I think you can do better. No one had ever said that to me before, Mm. but he really took me on and he said, I think you should compete. And so I said, well, what does that mean? What does compete mean? And he said, I think think what you should do is compete in a bodybuilding show. So, so here's me now get this. Okay. I'm a school teacher, mother of three children, all under 20, they're teenage girls, formerly fat. And now I'm going to get on a stage in my stripper heels with a bikini, uh, no, <laughs> but he issued me the challenge and he said, well, if you want to change your life and you want to look like those people in the gym, the ones with the cuts and the muscles and, and he said, I think you can do it. He says, I've trained other people. I don't train too many. I choose them. And I just went, okay, I'm in. What do I have to do? And I was supremely coachable because I had no preconceived notions at all. He just said, you eat what I tell you to eat. You train the way I tell you to train. You do exactly as I say, we'll get you competition ready. And I did. So I was wondering about what people say when they start to turn things around. And there's one quote that you just said from Robert, Mm -hmm. and that's, you can do better. That is him challenging me. I would say that I probably lived a pretty small life and hadn't really tapped into my full potential. I knew I was strong, but I never tested myself. And the gym was a really good place for me to test that. And when he said, you can do better and you can lift heavier and you can go harder, I believed him. (laughs) Although I really wasn't going on experience. He just said, just just do what I tell you to. I mean, I didn't even know what a triceps was. He asked me to flex out my triceps. I went, I don't know what that is. That's awesome. Yeah, I was pretty green. Um, (sighs) But when he challenged me, what he didn't realize was, I'm a bull. I go. And so he was maybe somewhat surprised, although he might have made an educated guess, but I dug in. And every time I hit the weights in the gym, it was just like a absolutely liberating experience for me. And I grew stronger. I was one of those people, he said I was unusual because I grew stronger as the sets developed, as opposed to usually people are strong in the beginning and they fade out at the end. I get stronger, which Uh, is unusual. As as you go through the reps. Yeah. you get yeah. stronger. So by set four or five, like the first two are throwaways and by set four or five, I'm really in it. So I was unusual in that way and he could push me and he did. Do you think that working out is a metaphor for life? Damn. Yeah, I think, I think you could measure that one up against resilience. Yeah, uh, it, I, to me, it's um, the word you stress, positive stress that, that tests us, challenges us. And if we're up for the challenge, we get better. We develop and we grow. So for me, that's absolutely what happened. I never felt so alive and so switched on and so in charge of myself as when I was in the gym. Mm. Yeah. And it was probably a combination of physiological, right? As well as psychological oh. impact. Because you... It's, I think for me, working out is an attitude adjustment. You're giving me the shivers. Literally, <laughs> I've physically got the shivers here. Yeah. It, it's an attitude adjustment. I, I mean, yes, it kept my booty in shape. I mean, I got a booty. I didn't have one before. But what I really found was the power of my mental state, the emotional state that's shifted so much. When you're in the gym, that experience harms no one. 
The weights don't talk back. They don't ask you for a peanut butter sandwich. They don't bitch and moan. It's you and them. Right. It's your story. It's your dialogue you're having with that equipment right. in your body. And t- I really like the challenge of it. Wow. Yeah. I never thought of all those things. When I go into the gym next time, it's going to be a different experience <laughs> for me. Back to when you were, you said 205 pounds and you left your first husband mm-hmm. and I read in one of your books that you said you finally decided that you were going to seek freedom and happiness. And I thought, wow, a lot of people would be seeking revenge. Yeah. How did you come to that I just positive knew, mind space? You know, I just knew with, with my first husband that there would never be freedom if I was looking to get revenge because that's what he loved best. He loved to dig in and be stubborn. And I thought my best freedom will be to seek success on my terms and I'll be done with him. I, I, he doesn't owe me anything. I don't want anything. If I'm really going to make a clean break, then it's going to be clean. And that means no expectations from him. So I was good with that. Yeah. And then the second big dip in your life was when your stepson passed away mm-hmm. and then Robert died of cancer within a year, right? Yes. Yes. How did you dig yourself out a second time? You must have just been like, come on, people. Oh, well, I'm just coming out of it, I will say. And <sighs> Brayden passed in 2011, my stepson, um, from complications from a car accident. He had lived for uh, 13 years as basically a, a vegetable. But we had him at home here and cared for him. And um, I wrote my first book for him because it was all about how to you know, eat soup. He couldn't eat but he could eat soup. So that, that you know, there was a lot of learning for me. Uh, I was definitely on new ground. And then Robert's passing just was a massive shock. No one saw it coming. Braden passed in 2011 and not even 12 months later, Bob was, was palliative. He, he was stage four lung cancer. And So, and for the listeners that don't know, Bob was superhuman. He was yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger's buddy, right? He, yeah, was, he brought Arnold here. He, Arnold's been in this house at this table with all of my family. And Robert repped out plate-loaded leg press, 250 pounds on Christmas Day. The man was no wimp, but his body at six foot two, once Mr. Mr. Khan International, <laughs> he, wow. he had a great body. Um, <laughs> even though he was 20 years older than me, he still had that good body. Uh, but the cancer ate him. Basically ate him alive. And how long did he have cancer before he passed away? Well, we got the diagnosis on January 27th, 2012, and he passed April 12th, wow. the same year. So just months, quick. months later. Yeah. And in a way, that was a blessing because he was not a good sufferer. And, and I didn't know, know any of what was yet to come. Okay. So it was enough that Braden passed and then Robert. A year later, I would be bankrupting our publishing business, his publishing business, which he had handed over to me in his will, but I knew nothing about publishing. So then I had to do the forensic accounting and learn, you know, the really the deadly truth that he had been insolvent for five years prior to his passing. But I had to pull the trigger on bankruptcy and his employees did not like it. Right. It was not pretty. So as a result of that, I lost my business, which was separate from his. My first book out of that whole terrible debacle was a commercial failure because that was basically a roadkill. And then I learned that this whole house in which you're sitting, and if you hear noise in the background, it's the waterfall and the estate and the grounds and everything. Absolutely stunning. I look out, I do see waterfalls, I see forests. Leveraged completely against the bank. There had been no mortgage and no debt and he had leveraged it against the bank. Uh So when I leave from here, I leave with my skin, which is hard for people to believe. So... The first dark period was basically divorcing my husband. He was abusive and all the rest of it. The second is divorcing this life. And it, it did not come easy, this work. I had to really, it's been seven years of slogging and doing the emotional work. And that really brings me to that, the three E's component where I learned I could exercise and I could eat clean but I couldn't fix myself. I had to get deep and down and the, the fugly cry and the snotty nose and the, you know, the painful looking inside your heart to get to a point where I can now walk away from here and be grateful for being clean of it. So do you think it helps people who have 
traumatic. For some people, it is a traumatic event or some kind of negative Mm -hmm. situation in their life for them to physically leave. I do, because I I think, and and I'm glad you said some people, because it's not for everybody. Right. Let's face it, I gave this a try. I've been sort of resuscitating a dead horse for at least six years here trying to make it work. So I have no shame in that fact. I did my best, but it's sucking the life out of me. So for me, my strategy was I'll do my best, but at some point I'm going to have to make the cut. Other people just have to run right away. You know, we all have an individual response. But I, I can say this now. I couldn't say it then. I can say this now. I know that Braden's passing and Robert's passing, and the business, and the house, and the life, and the material, all of that, these were all lessons. And was I student enough to handle them and absorb what I needed to absorb? I would come out okay. So I think I can say this now, that I'm coming out the other end of it, and I paid attention. I did the work. Wow. Okay. (laughs) I don't know where to go from that. Because there are points when you're looking in the mirror and you're looking at yourself and you're thinking, I have stood in front of this manure pile so long, I don't actually know what I've got anymore. And that's how I felt. There was actually a point where I thought, I should just quit everything. I've got nothing to give. I have no feelings of worth in myself. I just want to quit everything. And some not good thoughts about life, let me say. I can imagine. I mean... Yeah. You you wouldn't be human if you didn't go there at mm-hmm. some point, right? I never hit the bottle or drugs or anything, but there was a time where I just thought, I just want to step off. I'm so tired. Yeah. So I know people who are typically happy people and highly functioning people mm-hmm. who for some amount of time will, will lose their sight of a future goal mm-hmm. and then they seem to lose their happiness. Do you think that there's something in that? Well, yeah. Put it this way. The thing that gives me happiness in this life is to know that I can change a person's life. I can change a person's status, how they think about themselves, how they feel about themselves with the knowledge I've learned over these last 20 years. I can make a difference, and I have. So that gives me great joy. So if I'm not doing that, if I'm not aligned with my purpose, I'm going to feel pain. So if I'm not doing that, then I'm losing sight of everything. Then I'm going down. But... Fortunately, I have a daughter, Rachel, some will know as Dr. Rachel, who just is that person who has an amazing ability to connect and she knows when somebody needs help. So, you know, the first time I was down on my, well, actually I was flat out in bed, flatline pretty much after Bob died. And she said, you need to start meditating. And she just gave me the Headspace app and said, start here. And it was nothing. It was like a, you know, 10 minute freebie app. Try it. The second time when I basically flatlined on my career, she hooked me up with an executive coach and she has basically resuscitated my career because she she connected me with what I needed to know about myself. Here we go. Now I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to get up every day. That's amazing. This feeling good you have again. Purpose. It's you have purpose. feeling good again. Yeah. What's interesting about that response is that you're actually helping other people and you're helping yourself at the mm. same time. It's almost like yeah. a double whammy, right? It's interesting. So I still need the title for that book. <laughs> <laughs> because once I thought I was going to call it model of resilience and I thought, you get that diva out of there. Let's just get in the trenches because being resilient is not, you know, ABC simple. It's not math. It's <laughs> to get to that point where you are resilient means you've got to fall a lot of times. You've got to go through failure, get up, keep going, fall again, fall again, fall, and then get up one day and go, yeah, I think I'm finally here at the point where I could call success, but I know I'm going to fall again. Do you ever imagine if you hadn't had this adversity, what you would be doing and maybe more importantly, how you would be thinking about yourself and how different that would be? I think I would not be a good person. I think I would have gone down the road of materialism and the next it bag and you know what car I can drive. I'm not sure because that's not really my true nature, but I could feel that it was going that way. And so now I can say... Two words in the same sentence that don't sound right at all. Grief and gratitude. I can grieve for my lost husband and my son and the business and the life past, but I can be grateful at the same time because they have given me some of the greatest lessons of my life. Wow. (laughs) Wow. So over the last, I guess, seven years 
as you've been developing your online business and getting clients and now introducing them to the three E's, I'm wondering if some of them have shared stories with you about resilience that you could also share. Yes, I can. You know, some of the greatest nourishment I get for my soul comes from the stories people are willing to share at the times I least expect it. So there is a story of a young family, a friend now, but in the day, she was a follower of Eating Clean, and they had five sons. And they had gone through financial hard times, lost everything, had nothing. And that mother made a decision to continue to nourish her family with Eating Clean food because she said, if I don't keep us well with eating clean foods, we will lose our minds. Wow. And every day they would feed their children, their young family, the right vegetables, the right nutrition, not the cheap stuff, but, you know, they made that sacrifice so that mentally they could stay in the game because they lost their house. They lost their livelihood. They lost their savings. They lost everything. Status is a thing that we crave as human beings. We, may, we take it as a dirty word, but we make a lot of decisions based on status. And when you lose all of that, you are down. And it was the nutrition and the structure of how to care for yourself through nourishing yourself with clean foods. She said that is what gave her the stamina, the will to keep going. They've since rebuilt their lives, have a, a beautiful life again. There's so many stories. There's literally thousands of stories. <laughs> I remember one time I was at an event. I could see that there was a mom and a dad and and a, a young sort of teenaged girl. And they were waiting, waiting, waiting. They want a private moment with me. Finally got a chance to speak to them. The mother and the father were just like clinging to each other. And the young girl said, Oh, dear. I just want to thank you for giving me my life. And I said, what do you mean? She said, I just got out of the hospital. I have been severely anorexic. And I read your book eating clean. And it gave me permission to eat and love myself as I was. Wow. She said, I survived because you taught me how to eat. And the parents were just sobbing. I can imagine. It was a mess. And it was so beautiful. And it was just that moment. So that's sort of, yeah, it's just the, the experience of that, to feel that in your soul, right? And to know that that's happening. Like for every 10 stories I hear, there's a hundred I don't. Right. Amazing. And it's fantastic. I kind of asked you this before, but I, w- I want to ask again, maybe in a general sense. And the question is, does adversity make you stronger? And and I want to couch that in a specific question okay. in culture. I've heard people say that Hillary Clinton didn't have a story because she never experienced adversity. Mm. And perhaps that contributed to her lack of followers, right? And lack right. of voters. Right. So do you think that adversity makes you stronger? Do you have to experience adversity to achieve a certain strength in life? You do. Everybody needs a hero's journey and everybody's got one who's worth listening to. I think if you don't have adversity, you're living a small life. And I can say with 100% certainty prior to my my dark times, if you will, I was living a small life. I didn't put myself out there. I lived safe. I played small. I, I didn't dare. I didn't take risks adversity, it's like wine. Some of the best wines grow in the crappiest soil because they've had to learn how to grow. They've had to dig and fight for it and grab the nutrients and stretch for the water and stretch for the sun. I feel the same way. I feel like if it's an easy ride, you poke your finger in it, the whole thing might evaporate. But if you touch me and you push me and you test me with something difficult, you will find that I can stand up and I can take a hit and I will give back and I will love just as deeply and just as strongly. I'm not embittered. Wow. I did not anticipate that answer, but I love it. I love your point. It's actually empowering. Just stretch harder because mm. you might fail, but you'll probably make a difference to yourself yeah. and to other people. Yeah. And that really is, again, with plants, it's called you stress or positive stress. And it, it teaches plants to be stronger. And I, I think the same thing of people, that we need those difficult moments in life. We are given what we can handle. And it hasn't broken me, all of this. It should have maybe, but it hasn't. So you are handed only what you can handle. Do you think that's true? Well, I do because I'm here and I'm not a raging alcoholic. (laughs) Um, Although we are sharing a glass of wine, Um, (laughs) but that's okay. Um, I, I do. No one ever said 
that the ride in life was going to be easy. No one ever said that, right? Right. And I'm quite fine with having a good life. But a good life may also include some of those challenges that make us better people. Right. Last question I want to ask you about resilience. And it's probably the toughest question. Mm. But is there something that you can offer in terms of advice for people that are feeling helpless and hopeless? Oh, yeah. (laughs) And I have been one of those people, so I have deep compassion for anyone struggling. I read recently that if you look around you in your daily life, 50% of the people are struggling with a crisis of some kind. So first of all, we need to up our compassion game quite a lot. Secondly, we need to practice gratitude because even in the moments where we feel life is just giving it to us and giving it to us and it's relentless, there are things to be grateful for. Yes, I lost Robert, but I gained so much from him. He taught me so much about myself and the lessons are still coming. Yes, I lost my livelihood, but it taught me to rebrand. Yes, I lost my son, but his inability to move or eat or think or swallow or talk sharpened mine. I have been enriched for every one of those, and I'm thankful for them. Well, thank you very much for sharing that with us. Thank you. (sighs) Would you say that one of the main messages is gratitude? Gratitude, because it it raises your vibrational energy so much, right? And there's gratitude. You know, even Viktor Frankl in the concentration camps practiced gratitude and look what he had to put up with. Right. So we can find things to be grateful for if we just want to try to do that. And there's all sorts of research I've read about, uh, for example, writing down three or five things that you're grateful for every Mm -hmm. day increases your life satisfaction. But I feel like there's got to be something between helpless and hopeless and gratitude, right? Yeah. Yeah. well, there's there's something um, which I talk about in my three E's of wellness called the emotional scale, which is by Abraham Hicks. And it basically teaches you that the lowest vibrating emotion is shame and the highest is joy. And we're not in joy all the time, yeah. but even going from shame to the next higher vibrational emotion, which might be anger, is better than shame. Because at least if you're angry you're still alive and reacting to something. You can't get to a higher vibrational emotional feeling all the way from shame. It goes one emotion at a time. And the quickest way to shape or shift your emotional energy is through practicing gratitude. It's a way to actually move the needle on your vibrational uh, soul. So it's it's a leverage or a catalyst. It is. And the next thing you can do, and and this is where the pay it forward thing comes from, is to practice an act of kindness for no reason at all other than to do it out of self-love. So in other words, make a jar of butternut squash soup for your brand new neighbor. Leave it at the front door. Knock on the door and say, here, I wanted to give this to you to make your day better. No expectation of thanks or anything. See how that feels when you do that. Or go into, a, I did this recently, I went into a little Greasy Spoon Diner in my town here in Caledon. And I saw a group of students, they were studying, but they were sitting around a table. And I just went up to the cash and I said, whatever they're having, whatever's on their table right now, I'm paying for that. Because I was so impressed by their eagerness to work together. And I didn't want any thanks. I just paid the bill and walked away. Doing something like that takes you out of whatever it is you're mired in into a whole new place. You did it purely out of your soul. And there's no quicker way, along with gratitude, to shift that energy level for yourself. That's very empowering, too. And Mm -hmm. it's contagious, right? Very contagious, yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to move us on to the five rapid-fire questions that I ask every guest. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Ready for rapid-fire. First question. What are your pet peeves? Oh, my God. Poor spelling. (laughs) <laughs> poor yes, I can't stand it. <laughs> well, I read your book, one of your books, and it was definitely no typos. <laughs> I'm, or, or things like, okay, it's a workout. So it's, that means it's W-O-R-K-O-U-T, all together, workout. <laughs> no hyphen and no space. No, no, it's exactly right, right? So know the words you're using, especially if you're in an industry where the word workout is going to be used a lot, spell it right. Or if you're going to lose weight but not lose weight, 
Please. <laughs> lose You're going to L-O-S-E. Wait, not L-O-O-S-E, you know? So I'm, I'm picky about that. But. That's funny. That's <laughs> yeah. funny. Very. Okay, second. What type of learner are you? Kinesthetic. I'm not surprised. I have to be in it. I have to, I really have to be in it. I got to touch it, feel it, smell it, do it. Yeah. Do you think that affected you when you were starting to one word work out? <laughs> beautiful. (laughs) Oh yeah. Because I could see that was the thing. Like I needed to feel it all. It's just, yeah. Okay. Third question, introvert or extrovert? I'm a combination. So there's this wonderful book. um, Who wrote it now? I'm trying to remember. I think it's called Quiet. But anyway, so thank you. So I am a person who wants to be extroverted on stage, in a crowd, in public. But when I'm home, I'm an introvert. I think there's a word for that. I don't know what it is, but I definitely know that I have to be both of those people. It's ambivert. And you 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 are highly functional. I know you well enough to know that you are highly functional. When you're on stage, Mm -hmm. you are gaining energy from your audience, right? I'm on fire. And when you're at home and you're working at your desk, you are gaining energy from whatever you're typing. A hundred percent. Thinking about I just learned something. My IQ went up by a couple of percentage points. (laughs) Ambivert. That's me. Okay. Question number four. Communication preference for personal conversations. Personal. I got to be face to face. I have to look them in the eye because I remember eye color and something about looking in a person's eyes and seeing the color of their soul in their eyes just does it for me. Oh. So, so to I, some extent you are visual. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. But I read somewhere, I read this, like the, the, the most beautiful thing you can do for a person in their day is even if it's your bar- barista, if it's your person who's packing your groceries, doesn't matter who it is, take a moment to look in their eyes long enough to register the color. So that's what I do. And yours are fantastic, oh, by the way. Thank you. I'm going to try and do that. Yeah. There's something about the eyes. Yeah. So, and, and for those who don't know, Andrea's eyes are a brilliant blue. Oh, God. Thank you. <laughs> Yours aren't so bad yourself. You know you're a looker. Okay, fifth question. Podcast or blog or email newsletter that you recommend the most? I love this. A little bit off the wall. I love Legends and Losers by Christopher Loghead. He's an expat from Canada. His podcast is all about hope for the person who can't learn in, in normal situations. And he's made a complete success of himself. So now he's running this podcast and he's irreverent. And he drinks scotch on the podcast sometimes, but boy, he looks down the barrel and he gives it to you. And I love that black and white. I love him for business advice and for, you know, picking me up and getting me going in my day because, you know, when you're doing an entrepreneurial business, you're often alone. I love to hear a voice that that helps me get in touch with my business self so what better. Do you, what are you usually doing when you're listening to a podcast? Are you sitting at your table listening to the podcast? Driving. Driving. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. When I work out, I have to listen to rock. (laughs) And then another Canadian podcast I love is um, uh, Living Well with Leanne Lang, who is uh, an ex-CTV host and uh, just she's she's wonderful. I love her voice. She has a great series of connections. And of course, Andrea's. (laughs) Thank you for saying so. Okay. So I'm going to put links to those in the show notes for everybody, as well as to all of your books and to your website. If someone wants to get a hold of you, what's the best way to connect with you? So you can go to toscarino.com and all of my connectors are there. I'm on all the social media platforms. You can find me there and uh, I'm very good at answering email. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to add about resilience? Oh, Embrace the growth. When you are feeling like the earth feels unsteady under your feet because the circumstances are unknown to you and everything that you thought you knew about the way your life was going feels strange, that's growth. Embrace it, hold on for the ride, and let yourself spread out into that giant, beautiful person that you're meant to be because your purpose lives there. Okay, I will leave it at that. Thank you so much. (laughs) Thanks for having me. What an amazing woman, am I right? In the introduction before the interview, I defined resilience as the capacity to recover from adversity. Based on what I just heard from Tosca, her resilience is indeed exceptional. This woman not only recovered, but she flourished. I am so grateful for the opportunity to meet Tosca. Yes, we each had a glass of wine during this episode. Yes, there were real tears shed during the interview. And yes, we've become friends. Anyway, I want to summarize for you now the two main or general takeaways from this episode. They are how to frame adversity and 
coping strategies. For framing adversity, Tosca really does think about adversity differently, doesn't she? For me, this is a whole new paradigm. According to Tosca, it's all about seeking challenges and appreciating adversity itself as a gift. Think about it. Suddenly, adversity is good. I asked her whether she thinks we need adversity to succeed. Do you remember what she said? She said, everybody needs a hero's journey and everybody's got one who's worth listening to. I think if you don't have adversity, you're living a small life. And I can say with 100% certainty, prior to my dark times, I was living a small life. I didn't put myself out there. I lived safe. I played small. I didn't dare. I didn't take risks. Wow, that's empowering. And when it comes to appreciating adversity itself as a gift, Tosca said, adversity, it's like wine. Some of the best wines grow in the crappiest soil because they've had to learn how to grow. They've had to dig and fight for it and grab the nutrients and stretch for the water and stretch for the sun. She also mentioned eustress or positive stress and how it teaches plants to be stronger and how people are the same. We need positive stress. We need adversity, and we need to appreciate it as a gift. In addition to framing adversity, Tosca had some great insights about resilience and coping strategies, including taking responsibility, being grateful, and being compassionate. In the context of taking responsibility or ownership for your destiny, Tosca mentioned the analogy of working out in the gym, doing the sets and reps. When you're in the gym, that experience harms no one. The weights don't talk back, they don't ask you for a peanut butter sandwich, and they don't moan. It's you and them. It's your story. You own it. And when it comes to being grateful, do you remember Tosca saying that even in her moment of deepest compounded grief, she still felt gratitude? She said, I can grieve for my lost husband and my son and the business and the life past, but I can be grateful at the same time because they've given me some of the greatest lessons in my life. We need to practice gratitude. Because even in the moments where we feel life is just giving it to us and giving it to us and it's relentless, there are things to be grateful for. Tosca also highlighted the emotional scale by Abraham Hicks, where the lowest vibrating emotion is shame and the highest is joy. And how the most effective way of climbing up each level from shame through to joy is by being grateful. By the way, I'll get into gratitude a little more in the next podcast episode, so stay tuned for that. Gratitude is definitely an important element of positive self-talk. And last, Tosca reminded us to be kind and compassionate. Pay it forward. Bring your neighbor a jar of soup. Anonymously pay for someone's lunch. Look people in the eye. Register the color of their eyes. Hey, if nothing else, it's good karma. Before I leave you with Tosca's concluding words about resilience, I want to remind you about something really important. And that is the word workout has no hyphen and no space. It's all one word. There, that should make Tosca happy. Okay, Tosca's concluding words about resilience. She said, Embrace the growth that you're feeling when the earth feels unsteady under your feet because the circumstances are unknown to you and everything that you thought you knew about the way your life was going feels strange. That's growth. Embrace it. Hold on for the ride. And let yourself spread out into that giant, beautiful person that you're meant to be. Because your purpose lives there. All right, that's it. I'll be back next week with some of the research on self-talk, including five specific mindsets that we should all seek in our self-talk. And five things we can all do right now to improve our self-talk. In the meantime, please connect with me on social media if you have any questions or comments. I would love to hear from you. I'd also love it if you'd sign up for the Talk About Talk weekly email blog and encourage your friends to do the same. I hope you have a great week. Thanks for listening and talk soon. 